Well, first of all, I'd like to thank HUD for the invitation to attend this really fascinating meeting. And uh, so what I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon is a start out talking about a protein modification, o gluconeck And I just put the structures of glucose, glucosamine, and N-acetylglucosamine up here so that you can see that N-acetylglucosamine is derived from glucose and structurally very similar to it, except that it has an N-acetyl at the two position. And about 30 years ago, we discovered that uh, proteins were modified by this monosaccharide, and I'm going to talk about all of the many things it's been found to do. I'm going to talk about the paradox we call the O-Glucnac paradox because in the short term, when you increase glucnacylation of proteins, it's actually very beneficial to cells. But in the long term, it's the major mechanism, we think now, of why glucose is so toxic when it gets up to high levels. And then I want to talk about its abundance in the brain, where it's important in both appetite control and also in protecting neurons from neurodegeneration. And at the end, because of the nature of this session, I thought I would say a little bit about eating glucosamine, uh, which is a nutraceutical in the United States and is actually a prescription drugs in most countries. So now 30 years ago, we stumbled on the fact that nuclear and cytoplasmic proteins are modified by a monosaccharide, N-acetylglucosamine. And you all know about all these complex glycans out here, but at the time, the textbook said protein glycosylation did not occur in the nucleus and cytoplasm, and that's not true. And in fact, we now know that this is one of the most abundant forms of protein glycosylation. And so what is it? So about 2 to 5%, as we've heard throughout this meeting, of glucose metabolism goes through the hexosamine biosynthetic pathway and is converted to UDP glucnac. And a lot of the UDP glucnac, in addition to going to extracellular glycans, goes to O glucnac through the action of an enzyme O glucnac transferase and its removal, as you've heard, through an enzyme O glucnac ace. It's an extremely dynamic modification. It's like phosphorylation. It cycles very rapidly. It's not elongated. It's just a monosaccharide, goes on and off of proteins. It's present in all multicellular organisms, some bacteria, some protozoans, some fungi, plants and viruses. It's an incredibly abundant modification. Uh, it may rival phosphorylation, but it's much more difficult to detect. But so far, only about 4,000 proteins have been shown to be modified by o -glucnac. And as I'll tell you, it has a complex relationship with, uh, with phosphorylation. So phosphorylation, as most of you know, is the switching mechanism that regulates cellular metabolism and signaling. And it turns out that o -glucnac in a con competitive relationship with phosphorylation actually is a nutrient regulator of these processes. It's most abundant in the pancreas, the beta cells where it regulates uh, insulin biosynthesis, and also in the brain. It, dynamic it cycles very rapidly on a time scale similar to phosphorylation, and as I said, the cycling is controlled by these enzymes. So it turns out the donor, UDP glucnac, which you've heard a lot about at this meeting so far, is a, actually a major node of metabolism. And a lot of uh, people haven't appreciated that until recently. But the levels of UDP glucnac in cells are directly tied to glucose, amino acid, fatty acid, and nucleotide metabolism. So all of the major metabolic pathways in cells, the flux through these pathways affects the levels of UDP glucnac on, on, in cells. And in turn, the enzyme that adds o -glucnac is exquisitely sensitive to the level of udp glucnac. In addition, it has this crosstalk with phosphorylation, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. And because of this interplay, o -glucnac is involved in practically everything the cell does, transcription, nutrient sensing, neuro, the function of neurons, cell cycle, and stress responses. And just to highlight this, so the UDP glucnac is a perfect metabolic sensor because the levels are tied to nucleotide, energy, glucose, amino acid, and fatty acid metabolism. And to illustrate this, for example, in lymphocytes, if you uh, grow, these are jerkat lymphocytes, in what is considered normal glucose levels, and you run out a 2D gel and you do a western blot and stain using an antibody to O glucnac, what you find is in hyperglycemic conditions, there is a dramatic increase of o -glucnac on hundreds of proteins. And for those of you that are researchers, this is actually important to pay attention to because we all culture cells in tissue culture media that is diabetic. In other words, 
most most culture media that we grow cells in the lab have a 30, 20 to 30 millimolar glucose in them, something we need to worry about if we're studying signaling and transcription. The other thing we found over the years developing mass spectrometry methods to detect this modification is the crosstalk between glucanacylation and phosphorylation is surprisingly extensive. And I, what do I mean by that? Is there are proteins like the CMYK oncogene where the phosphate residue at the mutation site that causes this transcription factor to be an oncogene is, is phosphorylated or glucanacylated on, reciprocally on the same hydroxyl. This is actually quite common. It turns out in the case of the CMYK oncogene, in cells that are uh, dividing, there's a phosphate at this residue. In cells that are not dividing, there's a glucnac at this residue. There are examples where you have two populations of proteins where you have phosphorylated forms and glucnacylated forms, but they don't overlap. There are other proteins like the insulin receptor substrate that is basically a scaffold that contains all kinds of modifications, and each one of these modifications regulates the activity of the insulin signaling pathway independently of each other, uh, and it's really quite remarkable how complex this is. And then there are other examples where you can have both site-dependent and simultaneous occupancy. And so one of the re so in terms of site occupancies, there's extensive overlap, but in addition to that, we've recently learned that as many as half to, to three-fourths of the kinases, human kinases, are oglucnacylated. And so far, everyone that's been looked at that has the sugar attached to it is regulated by it in some way. So this crosstalk is not only at the site level, but also at the enzyme level. And this is not restricted to any particular family of kinase. This is the, the, the uh, evolutionary family of kinases, and you can see pretty much all of them. These little red dots are ones that have oglucnec attached to them. So since it was discovered about 30 years ago, there's about 1,700 papers directly related to oglucnac, and I just hit some highlights. It's been shown to be essential for lymphocyte activation. It's actually required for life at the single cell level. If you knock it out in plants or animals, the cells just die, the enzyme that adds it. It regulates protein interactions. A series of very interesting recently uh, published studies have shown that it's, it's the mechanism by which your circadian rhythm, so we all have a 24-hour clock in our cells, but the addition and uh, removal of oglucnac to these transcription factors that regulate this clock is how your body adjusts your circadian clock to how much you eat and when you eat and all that. So it fine-tunes your molecular clock. It's very important in diabetes. Elevated oglucnac actually blocks insulin signaling. Uh, there's studies showing that Abnormally high oglucnacylation, as you see in diabetes, actually changes the promoter specificity of transcription factors. And the transcription factors that regulate insulin synthesis are also regulated by the sugar. So it's tied up with uh, sugar metabolism in that regard. I'll talk about transcription very briefly. Uh, it regulates histone methylation, at neurodegeneration, blocks phosphorylation. There have been several studies recently showing that it's important for learning and memory in the brain. Uh, it actually regulates growth hormone signaling in plants. It protects cells from stress in the short term, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And it also regulates transition through the cell cycle. So like phosphorylation, this single sugar modification that cycles on and off does a lot of stuff. If you have an interest in this, uh, the Journal of Biological Chemistry, in honor of the 30th anniversary of studying oglucnac, published a special issue. And you can, so uh, there's a review articles on its role in transcription, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease, all of which are rapidly emerging areas uh, that are of clinical importance with this modification. So one of the things is virtually every step in transcription that's been studied is heavily involves this sugar. It's the way that nutrients regulate gene expression in terms of transcription. So there's almost no example, that, there's no example that I know of of a transcription factor that's not oglucnacylated. The enzyme that adds oglucnac is what we call a polycomb gene in that it regulates these major steps in development. Uh, that control things called Hox genes that regulate shape changes in developing organisms. The machinery that regulates transcription, the basal machinery, and the assembly of the 
machinery that transcribes genes at their start sites actually requires the presence of this sugar on RNA polymerase II and other components of the transcription machinery. And then the actual synthesis of RNA requires that this sugar be removed. It's part of the histone code, so it regulates epigenetic phenomena, regulates methylation and ubiquitination of histones, and it even regulates DNA methylation by the so-called TET proteins. And so, you know, it's very important in transcription. And so there's this Ogluknak paradox that's emerged over the years, and that is there are numerous studies out there, and I've just highlighted a subset of them, that has shown that if you elevate Ogluknak in, a, in cells, it actually protects them from stress. So if you expose a cell to heat, high salt, heavy metals, it doesn't matter what the stress is, one of the first things it does is, is it rapidly elevates ogluknacylation of hundreds of proteins. And if you do that ahead of the stress, it actually protects the cells from stress. And so this was discovered by Natasha Zahara a few years ago. And people have shown, in fact, that you, if you administer glucosamine after injuries, a lot of times the, the, the shock and the, and the damage that's done is greatly reduced. And so cardioprotection has been studied a lot in this regard. And in fact, recent studies in animals have shown that if you elevate Ogluknac uh, shortly after a heart attack even, it even protects the heart from reperfusion injury. So this is an area that there's a lot, particularly cardiologists, are very interested in. But the paradox is that if you elevate Ogluknac as occurs in diabetes and it stays up for a long period of time, that's when you start getting the, the diabetic complications associated with diabetes or what is called glucose toxicity. So for example, hyperglycemia in the, uh, inhibits endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which is very important for blood pressure control and other things, by blocking phosphorylation by the AKT kinase. It, it uh, inhibits calcium cycling, which is important for heartbeat, you know, various things. So it, 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 another example is it affects mitochondrial functions. Most of the things I've listed are due to the heart because that's where a lot of the work's been done. But the bottom line is, is that there's a, a now very large da uh, database in the literature showing that elevated Ogluknac is one of the major mechanisms of why high glucose is so toxic. And so what are the possible mechanisms? So I just told you that it's involved in practically every aspect of transcription. And there are studies in the literature, for example, showing the transcription factor SP1. When it gets hyperglycnacylated, it actually causes the expression of genes in the wrong tissues. And so this, can, this has profound implications for diabetic retinopathy and nephropathy and all these things. It also uh, disrupts the balance. So there's a balance between glucnacylation and phosphorylation in cells. And in prolonged levels of high glucose, for example, this, become, this balance becomes disrupted. More recently, it's been appreciated that mitochondria, uh, particularly reactive oxygen species production, contributes greatly to the toxic effects of high glucose. And so one example that came out in Nature as a collaboration we did with Don Bears at UC Davis. So Don has been studying this enzyme called cam kinase 2. It's a calcium calmodulin kinase. This is the enzyme that actually helps regulate your heartbeat by controlling the calcium cycles in the heart. And normally it's in an inactive form. It gets activated by a phosphorylation vent at this threonine residue. However, in diabetes, an abnormal event happens where a glucnac gets attached in this region, and this enzyme then becomes constitutively active, and it helps explain why people with severe diabetes have a lot of problems with arrhythmias and things. So that's a finding. So one of the interesting things about this old glucnac paradox is both the protective action and the long-term damage in the mitochondria involves the mitochondria directly. It turns out John Hanover a few years ago showed that there's actually a, a, a splice variant of Ogluknak transferase that is found in the mitochondria. And recently we have shown that the entire Ogluknak cycling machinery, including the UDP Gluknak transporter and everything are localized in the mitochondria. And, re, and so we've done some uh, glycomic analysis and have identified 84 proteins in the mitochondria that are modified by Ogluknak, the stars here. It turns out the majority of them are actually in the electron transport chain. Uh, 
And so under, and we have data with uh, studies where we've elevated oglypnec that have shown that, as you might expect for a nutrient sensor under normal conditions, when nutrients are high, oglypnec plays a role in actually making the mitochondria work better. So it generates probably what you But what happens in diabetes is really quite different. So what happens in diabetes is the levels of the mitochondrial OGT go way up. In the diabetic mitochondria, these are done in the heart again, in diabetic rats. But even more striking is in the normal uh, mitochondria, the, most of the oglypnac transferase that's in the mitochondria is located in the complex four, what is called the complex four of the electron transport chain. This is part of the component that makes energy, ATP. However, in the diabetic animal, by mechanisms that we don't understand yet, it gets mislocalized. In fact, a lot of it goes to complex three and also into the matrix. What happens there is you start glucanacylating proteins in the mitochondria that normally would not be modified by with the sugar, at least not as extensively. And the differences are really quite striking. And we've done mass spec analyses of these, and we know the identity of most of these proteins, but uh, I don't have time to talk about that. As I said, the glucanacylation is also very abundant in the brain. And so this is another part of this paradox, because it turns out that oglypnac elevation in the brain is actually fairly in, in a positive. So it plays a role in tubulin assembly. It turns out it regulates axonal transport of mitochondria down axons, which is particularly important in diabetic uh, neuropathy, because the longest axon in your body is from the spinal cord to your front explain why uh, diabetic individuals have problems with their feet. Uh, it's important in Alzheimer's disease, which I'll mention in a minute, but it's also incredibly abundant at the synapse. There's, uh, right now there's about 1,800 proteins that have been, been identified to be glucanacylated in the synapse, and also uh, 46 kinases at the synapse are modified by oglucanac. And as I said, there's studies showing that learning and memory is actually involved in this in some way. So one of the things we did recently was, uh, together with a neurobiologist and, and a graduate student, Olaf Lagerhoff, was we decided what would happen if we did a targeted knockout of OGT in an adult mouse brain. And the, the idea was to target only to a subset of neurons, excitatory neurons. And I, when, when Olaf just said he wanted to do this, I said that's all it's going to do is kill the cell because that dies. Well, it turns out post-metodic neurons in adult mice brain, when you knock it out, don't die. So this is the knockout showing what it, where you, but what you get is really remarkable. Within about two to three weeks, you have a mouse that's morbidly obese. And we've done a lot of studies on this. It turns out this mouse can't stop eating. It has a satiety defect. So what it shows is not only is oak looking like a nutrient sensor in the cells of your body, but it's also a nutrient sensor. It turns out in the, what is called the paraventricular nucleus of your brain, where it, uh, seem, and when you knock it out, this animal, um, it eats at the same time of day, everything else, but it just doesn't know how to know it's full. So it's called a satiety uh, defect. I would have never predicted that. So another thing that's uh, emerging in this area is a lot of excitement about uh, potential usefulness of oglypnec in treating. So for example, uh, some of us, disease is primarily a defect in glucose metabolism and, and, and resulting from a defect in glucose metabolism. And this has been around for a long time. So if you do PET scans and you look at glucose metabolism in a normal brain versus an Alzheimer brain, you can see it's markedly reduced. And recent studies out of Gong's lab in New York has shown in humans, patients, or post-mortem, uh, that oglucanacylation in the brain of Alzheimer's brains is dramatically reduced as well, as you might expect, since it's so dependent on glucose. So how might that work? Well, the prevailing mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease, at least the people in the field, field of study in this think work, is that one, what happens is something happens with the cleavage of the beta amyloid precursor protein, which is a transmembrane receptor on neurons, that causes it to produce abnormal peptides. These A-beta oligomers, as they're called, are toxic. They form fibrils and they aggregate. And these plaques 
it's thought, mess up signaling in some way that causes the tau protein to become hyperphosphorylated. Well, it turns out uh, that the tau protein normally is, ha is very extensively ogluknacolated, and when glucose levels drop in the brain, those sites are no longer covered with glucnacs and become phosphorylated. So there's this competitive relationship going on again. And so it looks like the, the prediction is, is if you could keep the glucnacs on the tau protein, it turns out beta amyloid precursor protein is also glucnacolated in the cytoplasmic tail, and this appears to regulate its cleavage in some way that's not really been studied enough. So the model is, is when glucose drops, the glucnac levels gradually as we age go down and we start getting phosphorylation events on, on the tau protein and other proteins, neurofilaments for example, uh, where the glucnac is serving a protective role to stop that from happening, you get PHF tau. And, and right now, uh, I know Merck has spent a ton of money on this, uh, uh, developing inhibitors of ogluknacase as potential Alzheimer drugs. And uh, so far in animal studies, at least, these appear very promising. So that's another direction that this area is going. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, glucosamine. So it turns out that a lot of people are eating glucosamine. And I just took some off the web some pictures of glucosamine sulfate. Turns out this, I'm not, I have no connection with any of these companies or anything, but it turns out that uh, if I were going to take glucosamine, which I don't, I, I would probably eat that one <laughs> just because in the literature, I, you know, they're the ones that are actually prescribed in other countries where it's actually a controlled drug. So what, it, you know, does it actually work? That's the thing, you know, so a lot of people eat glucosamine. Well, it's turned in the United States. I think it's a, one of the problems we have is nutraceuticals are unregulated. So you don't really even know what's in most nutraceuticals, let alone whether it's actually going to work or not. But glucosamine is like a $2 billion a year market right now. It's mainly just made from shells of crustaceans, although Cargill, it turns out, has a plant-derived form. And it's often combined with chondroitin sulfate, and some people are even putting it into foods and beverages and, and dog food and all kinds of stuff these days. And so the, I, I did some review literature on the, looking at this. So the Arthritis Foundation comments on it. So it's supposed to slow the deterioration of cartilage and osteoarthritis and improve joint mobility. Uh, what do we know about it? Well, you know, glucosamine is a major component of proteoglycans and things in the joint, and that's exactly how this was hypothesized to work. But we actually don't know really how it works. It turns out the clinical trials on this are actually mixed, and the reason they're mixed is because they use different products and some of the products are not good and others are better and it turns out based on my reading uh, if it was a really good quality chemical that contained pure uh, glucosamine sulfate then uh, it usually has some beneficial effect and in fact uh, I was really struck by this one a 200 2008 study 300 patients were found using glucosamine uh, when half as many joint replacement surgery so the conclusion is this, is the potential outweighs the risk, because it turns out that it isn't a lot of risk. So the idea is, in your joints, you have these complexes of proteoglycans and hyaluronic acid that serve as a cushion and protect the, your joints from rubbing together and, and all that kind of stuff and provide elasticity. And so what is hyaluronic acid? Well, it's a million some molecular weight polymer of glucosamine and glucuronic acid. The proteoglycans that are involved in this are made up of N-acetylgalactosamine and uronic acids that happen to be sulfated. And all of these other components are also glycoproteins. And so, uh, you know, eating glucosamine, does it really make that better or not? Well, so the recent studies have shown that eating glucosamine does have some effects that are quite striking. One is, is it reduces the transcription of matrix metalloproteases, which are proteases that contribute to cartilage degradation. And it also induces the transcription of the core protein for agricant. So these are beneficial effects. There have been a lot of randomized trial, but the, the bottom line with this is uh, the conclusion of, of all the studies I've looked at is eating it isn't likely to hurt you a whole lot, and it might help you. So uh, as, a, as my advice, I'm not being an MD and all, I would, you know, if you're going to eat glucosamine, you probably should talk to your doctor about it. Uh, 
But there's another way it might work, and that is we know that one of the major things Oglipnac does is regulate transcription factors, and the transcription factor that regulates inflammation and immunity the most is one called NF-kappa B. And NF-kappa B is heavily regulated by oglipnacylation. So it's very possible by these different mechanisms that have been published uh, in high-profile journals recently. And these mechanisms may, in fact, be the, the way in which it's acting as an anti-inflammatory. It turns out there's a, the biochemical evidence suggests that it doesn't have a lot of effect on the actual composition of proteoglycans in joints, which is the way people thought it might work. Uh, but nonetheless, it does appear to be working, so if I ever get arthritis, I'll probably eat it. So, in conclusion, this Oglipnac, which uh, wasn't known to exist until 30 years ago, it turns out is a very abundant form of glycosylation in all multicellular organisms. It's required for life in mammals and plants. It has this interplay with known signaling mechanisms to regulate signaling in response to nutrients, uh, it's part of every aspect of transcription. Uh, it, in the short term, it's very beneficial. It seems to protect cells from stress, but if it stays up for a long time, that's when you start to have problems, uh, particularly the mechanisms of glucose toxicity. And eating glucosamine appears to be beneficial for arthritis in some people. It's not clear how it's working. It may not be working the way it was originally thought that it was working. And uh, the thing I would say is if you eat glucosamine, based on what I just told you, uh, it'll increase oglipnac and will affect a lot of things. And some can be bad and others could be good, depending on the situation. And so here's the people in the lab who's doing the work, and we're collaborating with Don Hunt, developing mass spec methods, and these other groups. These are cardiologists at Hopkins that we work with. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, great talk. So um, just for that paradox about the um, short-term administration, those administrations are done uh, orally or are they infusions? Uh, a lot of the studies have been done um, in, in tissue culture models and animal models, but some have been, there have been a few oral ones where they just eat glucosamine. Yeah. I'm thinking of the uh, hemorrhagic trauma. But. Uh, you know, I don't remember. I'd have to go look that up. That was done uh, by a group at UAB. Um, okay. and, uh, the, reason, the reason I'm asking is so, so uh, presumably the high bolus in the short term, you can actually measure that proteins are generally over uh, lactylated, but then, then you would expect shortly thereafter, like within a couple of days or weeks, everything comes back down to normal? That's correct. It, oh, okay. it, the turnover is very rapid, actually. Okay, so the reason I ask that is because someone who's constantly eating this, they're constantly dosing themselves, uh, but that doesn't seem pharmacologically equivalent to actually having a defect of upregulating OA. So what makes it complicated, as you saw this earlier today in another talk, is if someone who's eating glucosamine all the time, the enzymes are going to adapt. The cell, the the cells want that for whatever reason they want to keep OGT and OGA within a narrow range. Considering that too much um, glucosamine might actually contribute to diabetic response, has anybody looked at what the uh, dose range would be? For example, at what doses, if if a human patient is taking it, what doses do you see alteration of the oglac glucosamination in, in the proteins? So the average dose is, uh, it, it's uh, one and a half grams, so they take 500 milligrams three times a day is, is what people normally take. And there have been st people like myself worried that that might be bad if you were pre-diabetic, might kick you over. And, uh, and there is some anecdotal evidence of that, but most of the studies of any, any note have suggested that that amount of glucosamine generally wouldn't uh, affect any kind of diabetic so I think the risk of eating one and a half grams of glucosamine a day are, per, a day are pretty minimal. And I always wonder, uh, you know, uh, I, wish, I haven't seen any data on this, but if people, elderly people eat a lot of glucosamine, the prediction would be they would be less liable to get Alzheimer's disease, but nobody's ever studied that. <laughs> so. Um, uh, great talk. So, 
Uh, has anyone looked at um, human diabetics and in particular compared type 1 versus type 2 diabetics? Because the mechanisms of glucose getting into the cell are, uh, are different. So in type 1, they may be, you know, uh, starved of glucose. So in, And so is ogluknac, you know, uh, being different in those two types of diabetes? Uh, well, so we have, we have, in animal models, we've compared high-fat diet-induced diabetes and uh, type 1 diabetes rather extensively and by the word different. Uh, they both cause ogluknac to go up. Whether it's on different proteins, it's not been investigated well enough. It definitely goes up in humans. In fact, we even have a, a diagnostic assay that's uh, potentially a diagnostic assay for pre-diabetes based on ogluknac in red cells. Uh, detecting it very early, way before hemoglobin A1C comes up. That's type two. Uh, that's in both, actually. Yeah, and that was all done in. Uh, it was actually patient samples we got from NIH. Yeah, Jerry, in um, in looking at glucosamine, uh, have really careful um, sort of modern studies been done on the rate of absorption, how much is picked up, half life average concentration in the plasma, how much actually gets into cells, any any sort of fundamental things like that? Oh, I think you know the answer to that. <laughs> the answer is uh, nucleotide sugar metabolism hasn't been studied extensively since the 60s, as far as I can tell, and maybe, and so that's an area of uh, biochemistry, if you call it that, that needs to be reinvestigated. Um, so, you know, the issues that you're going to hear, glucosamine and, and glucnac uptake by cells and effects on cells are actually very different from each other, and we don't fully understand that at all. And just in an organism, if you do it in a mouse and inject a mouse, I mean, has, has that been done in the last 30 years? Uh, glucosamine? Well, I hate, I hate to say no, because, I, you know, there may be papers yeah. out there that I've missed, but not, a, not, a, not, not at a level of rigor that you would want. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you, Jerry.